if they are going to have javascript development background easy peasy for them in terms of you know just four declaration and you have your component embedded wherever you want on the store front that's a powerful notion overall so you are not developing these you are not writing the business logic of these components from scratch you are simply declaring growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing this approach needs alignment among people processes and technologies so if you're a business owner operations or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors you're tuned into the right podcast welcome to the WBS podcast where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority now here is your host Sam Gupta hey everyone welcome back to another episode of the WBS podcast i'm sam gupta your host and principal consultant at independent erp and digital transformation consulting firm elevate iq headless composable and microservices architecture could be confusing even for developers but it gets even more confusing when you look under the hood with too many moving parts and not a clear understanding of which component is supposed to do what what is most confusing is this whole notion of the front end for the front end sound cryptic it is why would you need that there are so many reasons caching performance ease of development composability and scalability but mainly offline experience but is offline experience important for it retailers hell yeah when you are going to be installing commerce front on every corner internet may not always be available while this is great for developers as they have a lot more control over the process the way they lie are practitioners going to have the same control so how does who storefront help and where does it fit in the architecture in today's episode we are going to independently review who storefront's capabilities we covered many grounds including the importance of front end of the front end in the commerce architecture we also discussed where who storefront fits in the architecture and the importance of api orchestration layer in connecting with various e-commerce search cms and best of breed e-commerce solutions finally we discussed the importance of offline and lightweight javascript package that can improve the performance of e-commerce sites massively increasing their seo strength and as a result having better conversion rates with that let's get to the conversation hello everyone welcome to today's show and if you are joining for the first time this is part of our e-commerce series for which we meet every wednesday at uh, 5:30 pm eastern and we typically review uh, e-commerce technology or a vendor or a solution so for today we have a very interesting solution from the headless and composable community it's called uh, who store uh, front so we are going to have a lot of fun discussing that before we do that just a quick intro about myself if you don't know me sam gupta principal at elevate iq elevate iq is the erp e-commerce and digital transformation consulting firm we help our clients when the companies might be taking their digital transformation journey whether they might be more of the marketing side of things supply chain operations we manage their entire uh, program as well as help them with the strategy planning and implementation on that note if you are in the audience and joining for the first time make sure you guys post your questions and comments i will be reviewing them as we move along with the show and i'll try to cover them during the conversation if i run out of time then i'll make sure that you guys are going to receive your uh, answers on that note i am going to start with the quick briefing of this particular solution and this is a very unique beast and sometimes it could be very challenging to understand how each of the players fit in the ecosystem when you look at the headless architecture number one it's very 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 hard to understand the value headless brings to the table and when you are going to have all of these moving pieces and sometimes these moving pieces are going to be slightly more technical in nature so it might be hard for people who might not have as strong enterprise architecture background or maybe 
um, they might be practitioners. So for them, it might be harder to understand the benefits. But there are certain benefits of this architecture as well as uh, this particular technology that we are going to be talking about. And then we are going to be discussing why you need so many pieces and where Wu storefront plays a role. So number one thing in the e-commerce world, if you look at the legacy vendors, typically you had Shopify, BigCommerce, uh, Magento, any of the uh, slightly more monolith uh, platform where you had just one platform that did everything starting from your, and in this particular case, the e-commerce was acting more as the front end for the e-commerce processes. In the traditional architecture, the back end was more of your operational systems, slightly more ERP, central systems, WMS, those were slightly more your back backbone. But now, even in the e-commerce architecture, if you are looking for slightly more enterprise workload, then we are looking at decomposable architecture, and there are a lot of different moving pieces. We are going to be touching uh, on all of them. But for the most part, who is going to play the role of the front end. Now, what exactly is front end in the architecture could be very confusing as well. And why the commerce layer is acting as the back end. There are some business benefits of this architecture that we'll uh, touch briefly. So overall, their positioning is going to be uh, that they are going to be sort of the front end. And this is going to be not exactly the head head. Uh, in your uh, traditional commerce world. So here you are going to have slightly more, I don't know if programmable head is going to be a term, but that is probably going to be it. So from the developer perspective, these things are very, very easy to configure and control, and they are going to have a little API orchestration layer. And that is the one that is going to be uh, engaging with um, any e-commerce backend that you might have, if you are using any sort of CMS, then it can engage with that. So you can really create that composable experience. And depending upon what architecture you are trying to build, what business objectives you are trying to get from this architecture, you are going to get benefits. But for the most part, for SMBs, it could be overwhelming overall in terms of so many different pieces. And then obviously, you are going to have a little bit of technical integration less. Uh, with the architecture, so you need to assess where you are in your journey and what your core challenges are, where you are trying to get to from the business perspective, and that should dictate whether uh, you know any of these technologies are going to be meaningful for your business model or not. It should never be that, okay, who is probably the best technology, and you are going for that. In most cases where you are going to see who installed, I think they are sort of the go-to front-end partner for commerce tools. Commerce tools has their own front-end now, but Wu is still going to be the go-to front-end platform that they like to recommend. Now, some of the things that are very unique to Wu, this is an open source platform. So when you are going to have open source, now you are thinking that you are going to get this for free. Obviously, you have the open source development community that is committing the code for Wu, so you have certain benefits there. But at the same time, any of the open source business model, they have to make money somehow. And most of the open source business models, the way they make money is going to, going to be through the premium offerings. That's number one. And number two, it's going to be through hosting. So in the case of Wu, you will still have the hosting platform that they are uh, trying to provide. Now, if you are using them versus somebody else, then obviously there's going to be a little play there. So in terms of what is going to be most comfortable for you, but they are providing the hosting platform and that's how they are going to be making money. They might have some premium offering. I'm not too aware of that, uh, whether they have that or not. But for the most part, the hosting is going to be the play that they would like to keep at least because they have to make money somehow. So open source does not always mean free, but you might save some money overall from the licensing perspective uh, if you go with them. So that's probably going to be the benefit of this particular technology. Now, the other technologies that you are going to be needing with the, this particular tool could be slightly more expensive in general. So uh, for example, let's say if you are going for commerce tools, 
as the backend or you are going for Magento as the backend. And sometimes that could be confusing. Okay, if you are already using Magento, it already has a sort of theme or head. So why would you use Vue Storefront? And the reason for that is because you are trying to create the composable experience. And there are some unique layers and we'll be touching all of them during our conversation today. So you are going to see these guys Number one with, uh, you know, commerce tools, that is the most common probably. The second one is going to be Magento. They are doing a lot of work there in their presentations. Most of the time they are talking about Magento. Number three is going to be big commerce that they are prevalent and some of the other ecosystems as well, they are fairly prevalent. Now, the other confusion that you are going to have with the front end technology is, okay, where do these CMS platforms fit because you know when you look at CMS your understanding is going to be they are probably playing the role of head but that's not true because they are just the content management platform so they are handling the things more from the publishing scheduling of the content this whole multi-channel aspect the translation aspect of the content across the medium across the content type so they are simply dealing with all of that they do this based on the content modeling that they might have at their end so these guys are trying to decouple these two concerns. And one of the concern is going to be slightly more marketing concern, which is very creative centric that your creative teams are going to be operating on that. So they are going to have sort of the best of breed experience using the CMS tools. And that is going to be publishing to many different devices. So that's the CMS piece. But, you know, Woo Storefront is going to be just one of the front end where the CMS platforms are going to be publishing the content. Now, this could be very confusing for a lot of people who don't necessarily understand this architecture. So again, we'll be touching a little bit of that. So hopefully that provided a little bit of color for you. So now we will be discussing their story overall. So this particular piece of news is coming from 2021. And uh, they are saying the recent year was crazy. We have finally become a separate company launched the Woo Storefront Enterprise version, entered Mark Alliance, so they are part of that. Uh, obviously, any of the composable platforms are part of Mark Alliance, raised $1.5 million or $15 million, I believe, or $1.5, something around that, but that is a very small amount in general in comparison to some of the other players that they are tagging along in the architecture. Obviously, they have far higher funding, far higher valuation, but in the case of Wu Storefront, they are still not as highly valued, even though they are going to have a lot of installations just because of that open source aspect, because the developers are probably going to love this. This is a very developer friendly platform. And one of the problems as a practitioner that you are going to be struggling with is when you are going to be using this, obviously the development is easy because it's all JavaScript. But for a marketer, not sure how easy this is going to be. So traditionally, in the traditional platforms, marketers had uh, a lot more control in general in the way they created the content the, uh, on the entire customer journey. But now you can have that control, let's say if you are using CMS. And CMS and CMS, you have done all of that modeling and you are pushing your content. We have seen concerns related to delays when you use CMS. But for the most part, that's how you are going to have your control. Here, let's say if you have to make any sort of changes, then you have to still work with a developer unless you have some sort of development capabilities yourself. So you might struggle a little bit overall with the platform. Now, some of the other platforms, what they are coming up with is they are trying to create this whole front end as a service experience but that is going to be slightly different because now Elastic Path, I believe, has launched. Commerce Tools is trying to launch. So what they are trying to do is they are trying to create the drag and drop, the composable experience inside the front end itself so that you can balance both of these world, which is going to be your developer as well as marketer. So even in this particular case right now, maybe Woo Store Front might develop that particular front end as well where you are going to have control from the developer perspective, but then you are going to have a theme where, you know, marketers can probably manage 70, 80% of the activities. But let's say if you want to develop one more component, 
that cannot be handled through UI, then you go to developer and then you manage that. So I think the whole industry is going to go there, but the whole composability piece makes it easier to do these things. And that's why this architecture in general is very solid, regardless of whether you are in the enterprise space or mid-market. Right now, for mid-market, it might be challenging just because of this whole uh, technical piece that you need to handle. But in the future, I think it's going to get easier. So here, this is the summit that they have, and they are talking about roughly 1,800 participants from over 19, 90 countries, 90. Um, so obviously, they are present in a lot of different countries. They have uh, a ton of participants that are hanging out in their ecosystem. So that's obviously a big deal. Now, they have some commentary here where they are saying, Wu storefront to integrations doubled and keep growing compared to what we had within the Wu storefront ecosystem. Wu storefront one ecosystem. So in two, in version two, they have improvised. Now you have a lot more integrations. But if you compare this with any other ecosystems, for example, uh, Shopify, BigCommerce, even Magento, you know, these guys are fairly lean overall from the integration perspective. And then if you are trying to bring your own payment providers, you are trying to bring your own best of breed tools from the marketing, from email perspective, from SMS perspective, from personalization perspective, the number of options that you are going to have, obviously, all of the options that you have in the composable community, in the headless community, those are fairly well integrated. But if you go outside of that, you are probably will struggle uh, because those companies are not necessarily committed yet. They might not be getting revenue share in this ecosystem, so they might not be ready to invest in the IP in this ecosystem. So again, the space is evolving. If you are an enterprise player and can afford to spend in those integrations, uh, you know that might be okay, but for SMBs, it could be a struggle. So here they are saying they have prominent platforms such as Magento, Salesforce Commerce Cloud, Spriker, uh, Shopify, Cellior, and that is the one I don't think I have come across. And these guys are fairly prevalent in the Amir region. So most likely either it is from there or maybe from Asia. So that's a very interesting one. Then BigCommerce, then Silius is very new for me as well. And then WooCommerce. So WooCommerce, BigCommerce, Shopify, Magento, obviously they have four big ones covered. Then Salesforce Commerce Cloud uh, is there. Um, then we have Spriker, and they have not mentioned Commerce Tools, but they are very tightly integrated with that as well. So for the most part, I think these guys are one of the go-to platform from the front-end perspective because most of the commerce platforms that we have in the community that are slightly more API-centric, they didn't really have a head. So they had to find a head that is going to work with their platform. So that's why this is probably the go-to option. Now, in the CMS space, you have several options. You have MPNs, you have Contentful, Content Stack, Story Blocks. So there are many different options. But for the most part, for front-end, obviously, you have some here as well. But this is probably the go-to option for a lot of companies. So here, overall, from the architecture perspective, so this is going to be your store front that you are developing. So this is like your real web page that you are going to see when you are going to be developing this particular framework. And then you have the front-end framework and the API orchestration layer. So one thing that might not be clear to a lot of people when they are going to be reviewing these platforms, who is going to be doing the API orchestration, okay? If you look at this Shopify architecture as of today, or if you look at BigCommerce architecture as of today, Obviously, what you can do is you can do push and pull using the APIs. They have the web hooks that you can plug in your middleware, and the middleware is probably can help you get the data and that you can push to other platforms. That's easy. But here, the problems come when you have to really capture any of the events the way you would do it if you are familiar with the custom web programming. And sometimes the scenarios are going to be, for example, let's say, if I'm on WordPress uh, and I have very easy scenario where what I need to do is I have this mega menu and as part of mega menu, uh, what I need to do is as I click on each of the options that I have on the mega menu, now I want to display different content for my visitor 
And the reason for that is because let's say if I have the mega menu where I have 10 different industry and I have this big giant block of content and I'm trying to show a case study and the case study could be from manufacturing, let's say. But if the customer is going to be from oil and gas or they are going to be from media, then it's going to be really hard for them to be able to relate with that because then they are going to feel that the, this company probably does a, a lot of work in the manufacturing space, but may not do as much in my industry. So the customer is going to jump out, bounce out from, from the site. Now, that is the scenario which could be very complicated when you are going to be building with any of the head platforms just because you don't have as much control in your uh, web development the way you might be doing with these um, sort of the tightly integrated platform that is going to be your Shopify, Magento, Big, um, uh, Big Commerce, as well as your, your WordPress. So it could be very challenging. This is just a minor example of uh, what I'm talking about, but there could be many different scenarios that you might want to explore from the customer journey perspective. And when you look at the customer journey, the sky is the limit overall in terms of what you can do with your customer journey, the way your customers might be behaving. You probably need to intercept that, uh, make sure that they are going to get the content that they really care for. So you, if you want that customizability, it's not going to be possible with monolith platform. But again, if you're SMB, if you don't, don't care for all of that, uh, then it's a different story. But if you care for all of that, that's where uh, Woo, Woo uh, Storefront is going to be really friendly in creating that composable experience. And by the way, that is going to be across the devices. It's not just for your web or mobile. It's going to be any sort of more displays or any other displays. Wherever you like to commercialize, you can do all of that. So that's where that API orchestration layer is handy in general. And that's that's powerful uh, in my mind. Now, the hosting is very critical as well from Woo perspective overall, uh, because these guys are sort of hosting that. So that's very interesting. And that's how they are making money. So you need to keep that in mind if you are using them as the hosting provider. And then you have some of the the commerce backend, which is going to be, in this particular case, it is going to be either Magento or Big Commerce, or it is going to be commerce tools, those are going to be the backend pieces. They are going to be providing you the commerce functionality that is going to be interwoven with your uh, your front end, and which is, in this case, is going to be Woo. So that's pretty much it. Now, let's move to some more slides here in terms of the architecture. So here we are talking about front end framework. Obviously, this is going to be your Woo storefront. Then you have the API orchestration layer. This is also going to reside inside uh, Vue layer, and it's very important to understand who is going to be controlling which layer and who is going to be having the ownership of what, because from the licensing perspective, overall from the program management perspective, you need to worry about all of these things. Because uh, it, based on the code, I mean, the company that is controlling the code is probably going to be responsible for supporting that platform. So there are going to be some vendor issues as well. So you need to keep in mind where each of the layers are going to reside uh, from the business perspective. Now, in this particular architecture, you have several different platforms. They are hanging out with pretty much everybody in the market, whether you are going to be a legacy platform or you are going to be a modern platform. So number one, obviously, is going to be commerce, commerce tools. They are the ones who store front and commerce tools. They are connected to the app and they go together uh, in the market. So that's definitely going to be the ideal combination. Then you have BigCommerce. Obviously, that's a big one in the main market. Then you have Magento, another big one in the main market. Then you have Shopify. Celius is a new one. Spree is a new one. SAP Commerce Cloud uh, is a big one. So obviously, they are hanging out there. Now, SAP has their own React-based platform. So in some cases, the customers might want to use the open source. They might want to use this platform. So that's why they are going with them as well. Then you have Shopware. And Shopware is the open source platform that is very similar to your Shopify. Uh, very similar look and feel, but that's open source. Uh, so obviously, they are hanging out with them. Then you have Elastic Paths, which is part of your Map Alliance. It's going to be very similar to your Commerce Tools. Then Fabric, very similar to Commerce Tools as well. They are part of the Composable community. and then Vendor, I am not familiar with that. This is the first time I am coming across these guys. So that's very interesting. Now, here, this is the all of the CMS. And some of the CMS are going to have a little bit of overlap in terms of your DAM, as well as your personalization layer. 
So here, the role of content stack for the most part uh, is going to be to provide that CMS capabilities, which is going to be, okay, I am producing different pieces of content for many different uh, mediums. So how can I control that as the marketer? So you are going to be doing a little content modeling there and you are going to be publishing without worrying about uh, all of these technical pieces. So for you, it's probably going to be a very best of breed experience. So that's where content stack fits in. Now, Bloomreach is a very interesting example, okay? So Bloomreach, their primary product and the business model is really the that personalization engine, but they have a little bit of search. So there is always going to be a little bit of overlap in terms of who is doing what. So they have a little bit of search capabilities as well as they are positioned here as more of the CMS. So obviously everybody is doing a lot more than what they are capable of. Sometimes depending upon how you would like to build the architecture, but for the most part, Bloom Reach is really known as the personalization engine. And when you are creating the best of breed architecture, how you are going to be building this as you are probably going to have Woo as your storefront, then you are going to have, for example, commerce tools as your commerce platform, then Bloom Reach as your personalization engine, then uh, content stack, MPNs or content full is going to be your CMS. And then, uh, you know, any other uh, platforms that you might use in the architecture. So here, content stack and content full are probably going to be replaceable. Ampliance is very interesting as well. They are primarily CMS, but they also have the DAM integrated. So they also do a little bit more um, than just the CMS capability, which is very interesting because then you don't have to worry about the integration. And then uh, we have other CMS cap capabilities here. Those guys are equally popular. They all have their own sort of plays in terms of what they can do. Sometimes they are they can do multiple things, but you have the builder Rio, then you have story block, which is also a CMS, and then content, graph CMS sanity. So most of them, them are probably going to be in that CMS layer. Then you have the e-commerce platforms, and I don't know if there's a difference here. So this is your e-commerce platform that is very similar to this slide. And then you have the headless CMSs here. So this is also very similar to this slide. So I think we have already covered this one. I have a little comment here, so I'm actually going to cover this. So here, Anders is saying, great coverage. Any advice for handling multi-site vendor issues? For example, if one vendor is doing the front end and another is doing the API work, which organization would have priority over design decisions? So under, especially in the composable world, I don't know which design aspect you are talking about, whether you are looking at design more from the data modeling perspective, and maybe if you wanna clarify the comment, I'll be able to help you a little bit more, or if you are talking about the UX design design, okay? So those could be two different things overall. One is your foundational architecture, you know, how your data is going to flow across the systems, uh, obviously, in that case, then we have to consider the backend systems as well. But then the design issues are going to be, for example, for your UX as well. So here you are talking about any advice for handling multi-vendor issues. For example, if one vendor is doing front-end and another is doing API work, which organization would have priority over design decisions? Now, that's where your consulting companies are going to be handy, I guess. That's probably their job. I don't think Commerce Tools or uh, Boo Storefront are going to be capable of really setting the boundaries for each of the vendors. That's where you need to engage with a consulting firm, whether you are talking about one of the larger SIs uh, or boutique consulting firms. So those are the people who uh, specialize in the enterprise architecture, whether you are talking about marketing architecture or you are talking about marketing plus operations plus uh, finance, uh, you know, whatever the scope may be of the project, typically they are going to be deciding the boundaries. For the most part, these uh, systems, especially in the best of breed space, the composable space, they are fairly well integrated and they all are going together in the market. They cannot win alone. Okay. So the integration is going to be slightly more seamless and the way they're, they are structured, they all have their APIs. So at least the API layer is going to be tested and the way they are going to be deciding their boundaries is as long as you don't have any sort of problems from the API perspective, then I should be good. Typically from the enterprise architecture design perspective, obviously that's not enough. And that's why you need to engage with the consulting firm that can act as the general contractor in the case of your construction 
<laughs> or the general life guy uh, in the manufacturing. And that's where the consulting companies play a big role, especially with these complex architecture. Um, so I think that's how uh, I would say these issues can be handled. For the most part, I think the, the whole composable community, they are very, very, very good at not fighting with each other. They are very good at going along together in terms of setting their own roles and responsibilities. And the reason why they are so successful is because that's the mindset they have. But then now they, there is an overlap. Uh, you know, so obviously they are all going to be fighting with each other. So there's going to be a little problem there. So that it, it could be a challenge. That's all I can say. If you have any follow-up comments, I can cover those. Otherwise, I'm actually going to move to the next slide. Now, here we have some more commentary overall as well as um, the slide. So here we are looking at the payment integrators. So obviously, this is very, very, very lean. So you have, you know, uh, Airdian, then you have PayPal, then you have Mali, you have Stripe, you have Cybersource, you have Braintree as well. And this is probably the leanest payment integrations that I have personally seen. You might be okay, let's say, if you're just using the Stripe and then PayPal, obviously, is going to be your separate. Uh, you might have Klarna, but Klarna is not here, so I don't know if that is going to be integrated or not. But then if you're not happy with Stripe, you need to do something else, then you could have a challenge. So this is where the challenge is going to be in composable community in general, that the ecosystems are not developed enough, they are not mature enough, that you can get pre-baked integration for these things. And that's where you'll be investing a lot in the custom development. So again, I think this community is gonna grow. They are going to develop more integrations. In general, as of today, they might not have it. You are going to find a lot more options overall in the Shopify big commerce uh, Magento space. So obviously you are investing a lot, but for enterprises, they have different problems from the architecture perspective, from the workload expectation perspective, uh, the kind of uh, you know cutting edge experience that they are trying to build, they have different problems and that for them, it might be okay to invest in this because again, they are trying to have that market share and that is possible only when they are going to provide something that is going to be very, very different from any other mid-market uh, you know, manufacturers, retailers who might be uh, competing with them. So the search providers, again, you have all the mainstream search providers especially in the uh, composable uh, community. Now, Agolia, obviously, they are the heavy hitter, heaviest hitter. Uh, the second biggest heaviest hitter probably is going to be Constructed or IO. They are very common in these spaces as well. So obviously, you have two covered. Then you have Bloomreach. I mean, Bloomreach, it's a side gig for Bloomreach. The search is not the main offering for Bloomreach. But again, let's say if you don't want to worry about the integration, then you can utilize everything from Bloom Reach, they can provide multiple things. So again, you need to figure out, okay, what is your budget? What is the business goal? And where you are going to get the best value? So there is no clear cut answers in terms of whether you should be going for Bloom Reach or Algolia, depending upon what you are trying to do, depending upon whether search is going to be the first priority or the, the personalization is going to be higher priority or pre-integrated offerings, depending upon how much pre-integration you want. If you want everything pre-packaged, you are going to be very restricted, obviously. But if you're looking for flexibility, this is where these platforms can be really handy. Now, they are saying any third-party services, voice, analytics, chatbots, promotions, personalization, I think that's just a marketing hype. They might have some integration, but for the most part, it's a marketing hype. Obviously, they don't have anything there. That otherwise, they would probably name them. So be careful there. And by the way, one more comment. Uh, when you don't have the, the fundamentals down, for example, the payment providers, I don't know why you would be working on the cutting and stuff. Voice, chatbots, which could be great as well. But for the most part, I think you should get your basics down first. That would be my comment on uh, Woo store front strategy overall. Now, this is a little bit about the architecture. So they are saying if a developer wants to create a composable commerce site. So traditionally, let's say if you're looking for the custom website, and there were use cases in the market where you just could not do your business on Shopify big commerce. So the only choice you had is to create that custom website because you might have use cases which would not fit in your traditional commerce customer journey. So you have to have that custom website. So here uh, you can build the same custom experience, but you are not going to be investing as much and you are not going to have as much problem that you are going to have with your custom experience. And that's where the whole composable experience is extremely, extremely powerful. 
So here they are saying front end like who store front. So this is the whole architecture and they are trying to describe who is going to play what role. Obviously, this is written from who store front. So obviously, they are going to be slightly biased towards that platform. That's why they have not named any other platforms in their slides. But for the most part, who store front is the go-to platform, at least in the composable community. You know, when anybody is trying to build that had using the composable experience. Obviously, one of the other advantages is going to be open source. So they are slightly friendlier there as well, and developers love that. So here we are talking about front-end, Google Store Front. For the most part, that's what you are probably going to be doing. If you are choosing something like Commerce Tools, then you have the API orchestration layer. Uh, this is also Google Store Front. Then you have the third one, e-commerce platform for business logic. And I think they have worded it correctly in terms of the role of the platform. So here, I think they are right that the role of e-commerce layer is primarily for the business logic of the commerce layer. That's what they are asking the commerce tools, big commerce, elastic path, Magento to play and decouple that presentation aspect of the, the e-commerce experience. So that's where the real it is. And sometimes it's very, very difficult for people to understand why that is so. But this is done to separate the concerns to create that best of breed experience. So the third one is going to be your content management system, which is going to be your Bloom Reach content stack, content flow. Uh, this is the CMS. And again, when you are going to have this whole centralized publishing experience that your marketers and practitioners require, that's where you are going to be needing that content management experience. Uh, otherwise, you will have a hard time in controlling which content should go where. And obviously, for practitioners, it's a nightmare if this particular platform is not going to be centralized. And if it is going to be too technical, for the most part, let's say if you ask any marketers, if you typically for them, let's say if you have they have to learn Magento, it's a nightmare for them. It's too complicated for them. You know, they will require a lot of training. Something like uh, you know, content stack, content pull, they can easily pick up because uh, you know, it's just easier for the marketers. And then the back end, the content modeling piece is going to be pushing the content wherever uh, they need to. And by the way. The Magento is not probably going to provide the same capabilities that your content management system can provide because they are going to have a lot of uh, you know content control, the governance, uh, et cetera, the scheduling. All of that was never part of your e-commerce layer. So companies might be using some other DAM or the CMS, but now uh, this is slightly superior experience overall. Uh, the way these systems are designed. Then you have the search applications and search is a powerful, powerful concept, the way search works in general, the kind of scenarios, the kind of things that you are able to do uh, from search perspective, especially Algolia, super, super, super powerful cutting edge stuff in terms of what you are able to do with that. Uh, Bloom Beach obviously is there, the constructor.io, and then you have the hosting. So again, uh, Wu is talking about this from their perspective because obviously, they have to make money. So that's why they are pitching for hosting, even though it is going to be open source. So here they are talking about various third party tools like loyalty payments and more. In many ways, the structure of FEEAS, and that is the front end as a service. Um, and that is very similar to what Commerce Tools has announced Elastic Path. They have come up with their offering. So I don't know how the, the market is going to go. Most likely, they are probably going to be competing with each other now. Uh, they might not be you they might not utilize as much front end in the future so obviously there's a little bit of consolidation happening even in the composable community and that's going to happen as the industry matures so you are looking at pre integrated pre packaged pre baked but then the composable experience as well just because the underlying architecture is capable enough uh, to provide this experience. So here they are talking about also known as on demand software uh, so they are using another term con on-demand software, uh, which is very interesting term. Now, on-demand could mean a lot of different things. But then I think what they are referring to is it's more of the consumption-based pricing for each of the layer. Uh, but that consumption-based pricing, when you are going to be utilizing each of the modules, as well as the microservices, sometimes that could be very hard to compute in terms of what is going to be your total ROI, what is going to be your total cost of ownership. So you need to be careful there. So on-demand sounds great on paper, but it's, it's a nightmare for a CFO. So again, you probably will require some help in computing because sometimes the variables that you are going to have are going to be technical variables that you may not have faced in the past and you don't know how to estimate them. For example, some of the technical variables could be 
anytime a queue is going to send the message, there's going to be a one cent that you need to pay. Now estimate that cost because you don't know how many messages a queue is going to touch. So you have to estimate all of that. So for program managers, their jobs are going to be harder in estimating the, the, the ROI, the TCO. So obviously you have a little challenge there. From technical perspective, obviously this is very friendly. Now here they are talking about pre-built modules without uh, developing them from scratch. That is right. Uh, you know there is a lot that you can get done. Uh, you know by and this is a very similar concept as your Bootstrap. And if you guys are familiar with any sort of web development, traditionally people used to code literally everything in your HTML, CSS. Everybody would have their own standard. Uh, you know there were no sort of standards in the web development community. But then Bootstrap started, they had these building blocks and it was really easy for developers. And you know it provided sort of the, the framework for developers to be consistent in the development methodology. So this is a very similar experience. They are sort of providing the Bootstrap for the composable community in terms of the kind of components you have. But here, the components are going to be your commerce components. So Bootstrap was for horizontal pure play web development. But here you are talking about okay component as much uh, component like your your cart could be a component that you have a piece of code that you can dump in you need to you don't need to create the business logic for that the business logic is already done the only thing you are trying to do is you are simply trying to compose that experience which is uh, which is much easier in general even though a lot of people talk about you know how difficult this is going to be because oh my goodness they're so technical in nature but the only thing you are really doing is you are really meshing embedding that experience obviously when you are paying from your own pocket uh, it could be very expensive in general okay uh, but at the same time you have that flexibility here uh, we have some more uh, comments so they are talking about many enterprise e-commerce businesses have reported that using a uh, front-end as a service solution saved them up to 500,000 US dollars in development cost and up to eight months in development time to get to the market faster and i believe them but you need to think about if they are saving five hundred thousand dollars then probably their investment was five million dollars uh, in the web, web development and if they were developing uh, these platforms from scratch and this is going to be platforms such as for example let's say you have ea.com or if you have bankofamerica.com and you are looking for that kind of commerce experience uh, that's what was very expensive because you had to develop everything from scratch. You can never uh, assume that you know Shopify is going to work for AA.com or it's going to work for BankOfAmerica.com. So that's where uh, the real enterprise uh, e-commerce play is in general. Uh, that's where these platforms really shine. But now they are also coming down to the mid market just because of the flexibility that these platforms can offer. Now we have uh, some more commentary overall from the architecture perspective. So here we are looking at composable tech stacks for e-commerce. Here we have Vu Storefront's growing integration ecosystem. So we have a lot of different tools. I think we have already discussed this. Uh, these are the e-commerce platforms and some of the e-commerce platforms that are listed, for example, Odoo. Odoo is an ERP, but they also have that e-commerce layer. So I think they are listing them as the e-commerce platform that Vu is trying to uh, check along with them. So Odoo is there too. Then you have PrestaShop which is sort of new what else have we not looked at the payment is very 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 lean in general but overall from the blue store front perspective this is how your apis are going to provide that experience and this is what is best of breed because it is coming from many different vendors in general and you are matching that experience in your front end layer the way you like uh, you know from the event whether the event is going to be from your payment service providers or they are going to be from the cms so there is a lot of power here in general, the kind of experience that you will be able to create. And by the way, we have listed only four display here. You have Mac OS, Windows, Android, iOS. But if you look at the number of devices, you know, if you look at the true e-commerce experience, the enterprise companies, once they sort of understand how these things work and what is going to be measurable ROI in rolling out these things, they are probably going to be rolling out the e-commerce experience everywhere, whether you talk about uh, you know behind the bus or uh, trains or malls you name it i mean you can put commerce anywhere so that's where the real power is when you are going to have all of these devices when you are going to have commerce in your home when you are going to have in the iot device that's where the power of these platforms is if you are just building a web shop then you can probably go for shopify but if you really want to understand what all you can do more from the scale perspective 
the sky is the limit with these platforms so now here we are talking about the real storefront so one of the things that you might note here is the offline mode so one of the comments that i made uh, in the previous segment where i was talking about that okay why does this front end need to be separate from your back end and that was the question that even i was struggling to understand okay why do you need to separate that uh sure from the technical standpoint that sounds great but there has to be some tangible benefit and one of the tangible business benefit that a lot of people don't understand is that offline experience and i don't know whether you guys are familiar with the either google docs offline experience whether you talk about the um your netflix offline experience or youtube offline experience that offline experience itself is extremely powerful because one of the foundation of e-commerce is that you don't want to miss the transaction regardless of whether you are going to have the internet connectivity or not okay and there are going to be areas once you are going to have let's say once we are past this whole inflation period then obviously companies are going to invest and let's say if the industry 4.0 is going to be mainstream the iot devices are going to be mainstream then we are looking at a lot of different displays and devices so the companies that are going to be investing in these things today obviously they'll be able to scale these things faster and they are going to be grabbing the market share so that's where this whole offline experience you cannot get the offline experience with the pre integrated component it's very very hard so the way woo storefront is designed it's able to provide the the offline experience that that's extremely powerful in my mind where you are going to be uh, you know offline you can explore the catalog uh, you can swipe the credit card in the offline mode can you believe this and as soon as the internet is going to be up then you are going to push that order that's very powerful in general even in the erp world you had places for example inside the warehouse you could not really operate with the erp if you are going to be on internet so what companies did is they had this whole on prem experience because the only thing that could work in those places is your is your data center because you are going to have your network connectivity but you didn't have access to the internet so imagine if in the erp world for the back end function offline experience matters a lot think about e commerce okay so this is extremely 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 powerful notion okay now this is how your components are going to be and overall when you look at these components they are very very hard to mash and build it's it's not difficult at all uh, it's not the same development time that you are going to have when you are going to be building these things from scratch and this is very commerce centric so this is designed for commerce commerce experience the only difference is here you are embedding this experience using code but let's say if you did something like shopify you are going to have a little drag and drop experience but even with shopify you still need developers okay so you have a little bit of control there here obviously developers are going to be doing this work so i think the way the industry is going to move you are going to have the balance overall in the way these platforms are going to mature these guys are going to come up with the uh, no code low code experience uh, for the drag and, drag and drop exp experience but then the developers can always push more components to no code low code experience so obviously these guys can develop th these things way faster just because their architecture is scalable so obviously the legacy platforms they'll not be able to catch with catch up with these guys as fast but you know the whole notion here is it's a very 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 reusable composable experience that you are providing from the commerce perspective and the only thing you really need to is uh, do is you are simply controlling the presentation layer how you want to present your the the web store front that is the only thing that you are controlling here so some more commentary here every component has a set of slots uh, that let you replace any part of it with your own uh, image so obviously there are going to be a little constraints even with this even though they are providing a lot of flexibility so any modular blocks that they are going to build are going to have some sort of constraints assumptions so you need to play with those assumptions but you can control a lot here uh, you didn't have the same control when you were using let's say shopify e-commerce so you have a lot more control here you can also customize whole library from a single scss file by overriding set of variables then you have the mobile first every storefront ui component is highly optimized for mobile user experience in many cases uh, behaves completely different on desktop and mobile so it's really optimized for that uh, you know the other platforms they are probably going to be optimized for uh, most displays and the and the functions but in this particular case i mean they have done a marvelous job uh, in optimizing that but obviously you you will require a developer 
this is not the, a, a marketing practitioner cannot really pull it off uh, especially when you talk about but the experience is going to be super slick over all the way the storefronts are going to look the performance is going to be very different as well that is another aspect when you look at the way the architecture is, is of these platforms it's completely decoupled and that's where that speed comes from and seo when you look at the commerce experience when you look at the marketing experience it's all about speed when you look at the seo so obviously these sites are going to be far superior in terms of the speed and performance so they are going to be ranking higher in general on seo so you have that benefit as well so yes there's a little bit of money involved but then you are getting the real seo juice in my mind but obviously this is going to require a little bit of expertise uh, with the architecture design so you have to hire expensive consultants if you are going to be hiring junior devs who don't know what they are doing then the experience could be worse so keep that in mind now every component is based on google retail ux playbook and they definitely have done a marvelous job as a ui library dedicated to e-commerce the storefront ui along with the standard ui components has all the elements necessary for yeah for the most part anything that you need for e-commerce experience it's all built up the only thing you really need to do is just customize your color design play presentation and you have a really good cutting edge experience ready for you to explore now the adding of the components if you guys are familiar with react it's very similar experience it's very reusable in terms of the way you are going to be doing this so you are going to have a little inherit uh, you know comment that you need to do and then you are going to be declare that and then you are going to be declaring the element so any developer can pick up on these things especially if they are going to have javascript development background easy peasy for them in terms of you know just pure declaration and you have your component embedded wherever you want on the store front that's a powerful notion overall so you are not developing these you are not writing the business logic of these components from scratch you are simply declaring these components but i mean you can declare that inside your react and angular and some people may argue that you could do that in them as well but that's not e-commerce okay so the e-commerce layer will still require you know a little bit of programming here you are getting e-commerce centric components it's not a pure play yet so that's where the real difference is here then this is where the real power is so when you look at these hooks the way you can utilize these hooks and this is where your custom programming experience and custom you can pretty much do whatever you want you had a lot of control um, in terms of whatever experience you wanted okay you had no limits there but in this particular case obviously when you looked at any sort of you know monolith platforms you lost that control because whatever they had exposed to you you just had that control sure you can go to the back end and you can probably control probably in magento shopify it's going to be really hard uh wordpress forget about it because you are probably going to have 50 plugins that are going to be fighting with each other so sometimes it's very hard to control that journey when your event is going to be thrown by one plugin and that's going to go to the next good luck with that it's going to be a nightmare but here you have all of that control as part of the front end layer which is massive massively powerful in my mind now some reviews that we are going to cover so let's see you know what the users are saying so and who is using that i mean that's always one of the most in interesting part for me in general when i review any sort of platform so here the company size is 51 to 200 so this is a mid market you know it's not very large so that's very interesting time use less than 6 months consumer services i typically like to look at the title of the person as well so in this particular case we don't have that typically this is going to be championed by developers you know and most likely they are going to be excited about it number one it is open source number two it is going to be very friendly for developers so obviously they will love this and depending upon who has more clout in your organization if developers control more then obviously they are going to be pushing for this marketers have control then probably they are going to be thinking about something else from the business perspective so here we are talking about by using woo store front we have been able to cut on bounce rate and server resources i completely agree with this comment okay so you can do a lot and bounce rate the only reason why they are able to cut down on that is because you are able to tailor and measure the experience at each pixel okay that's how deep it gets so depending upon and you will not be able to do that in your legacy platforms they just don't provide that customizability and i offered one example about mega menu and clicking and controlling your custom content there it's not possible in those platforms or it is going to require significant development and sometimes that's just not possible because uh, the platform may not support that and if you are over going to over customize that then you know you are going to have 
many other pl- problems just because those platforms were not really friendly for that thick custom development but in these cases they have designed these things from scratch for that modularity and that's where the real difference is in the architecture so that's why you have the reduced bounce rates and the server resources just the overall the size of boo.js is very uh, lean in general i think we have that comment as well so the way it is coded it's very light so obviously could have far superior performance like the browser the way it's going to load the other for example if you are going to load magento good luck with that it's probably going to dump i don't know how thick that layer is going to be so that's where some of the innovation is that you might not understand from the business perspective but that has, does help from the performance perspective as well as the way your experience is going to be uh, over all the speed the way users are going to feel they are going to feel when they are going to be using the site uh, it's going to be super slick in general just because of the the overall architecture now built with boo js which is for sure the future of front end great performance it is open source easy to set up great components most importantly it has a huge community of very active users and contributors for the developers that's massive okay you need support and for the enterprise platform sometimes that could be tricky to get that kind of support so obviously that's why this particular platform is well adopted makes use of elastic search and graphql and graphql is sort of picking up with the platforms not everybody has support for that even if they have support for that it's sort of all over the place but sometimes it could be very confusing uh, you know and sometimes it could be all over the place but these guys have native support for that the elastic search is going to be indexing a lot of data and that's where your decoupled experience is going to be between your front end as well as your back end magento so they are caching a lot of it inside your elastic search and they are delivering in the offline mode that's a big deal guys that's massive massive um, you know play there for e-commerce in general now uh, allow the use of jquery and other dependencies several bugs that need to be fixed to make it perfect uh here we have some more commentary allows to accept more simultaneous simultaneous users now that's a big deal okay uh that comment itself is a big deal in the traditional commerce experience for example let's say if you are going to be in magento or php php if you are on wordpress you are probably going to struggle after you have 20 30 50 60 simultaneous connections sure you can increase the number of sessions you can increase the server resources whatever but the the whole platform is not designed for that okay and these guys have done marvelous job in designing that and that's where you are going to be able to use this for fewer server resources but more simultaneous users and that's where these enterprise workload they can manage with far lower hardware footprint and that is going to translate into lower dollars for you overall in the maintenance and the server capacity but here you might be investing a little bit more uh, in the web development so that's a huge business benefit right there reduce the bounce rate increase business speed of navigation is a new discovery for e-commerce now we can now prepare for purchases during our uh, you know one time off in transport for example no more native applications we have web application available which is updated without any action vu storefront offers advantages over magento pwa and by the way these guys are using it with magento can you believe this magento can offer the same capabilities but these guys are happier with vu storefront and the reason why they are happier is because they are getting superior performance they are getting reduced bounce rates they have far lower uh, you know hardware footprint so server resources are not going to be as many so your bills are going to be lower so you have tons and tons of business benefit the only challenge you are going to have is how do you translate that how do you explain that to a cfo obviously that's going to be a challenge just because it's sometimes these technical benefits are very hard to translate in the financial dollars and that's where some of the consulting companies might be able to help in general but again when you are going to be uh, getting these benefits in 2 uh, 3 years sometimes that could be harder um, to uh, realize visualize Uh, as well as understand and appreciate the complex features uh, are missing such as your catalog rules as well as basket rules so obviously these uh, platforms are coming up so they don't really have as much deep functionality that b2b e-commerce is going to be needing b2c it might be okay b2b you are definitely going to struggle here we have some more comments so they are saying we were trying to increase conversions and google page speed scores and we were trying to give better experience to our customers the default templates template ends up lowering your page speed score with a lot of customizing the user experience is not good without a lot of customizing basically we saw a drop in traffic 
conversions and page speed scores by switching okay the solution is built by developers for developers seemingly without any real consultation with people who actually do the e-commerce the search does not allow and logic which is basic and needs to be customized the default theme does not have a horizontal menu even on desktop again basic and needs to be customized don't these star reviews don't work need to be customized almost every single payment methods need immense customization to get to work no zoom on products schema structure is basic at best and misses a lot of information many things are skipped by ssr basically it is a developer dream and a retailer's nightmare now that's a very interesting comment obviously the theme of the comment is going to be customization 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 and customization equates to dollars dollars and dollars which is true as well to be honest okay so again when you are driving ferrari you probably need to hire a coach who is going to coach you how to uh, you know drive ferrari uh, if you are going to be uh, driving on your own without really investing time in learning in understanding how these things translate for your business you are not going to get the benefit you are actually hurting yourself by utilizing these platforms so if your goal is just to produce that plain old e-commerce experience as a storefront these platforms are not necessarily for you okay you will require a little bit of training in terms of understanding where the capabilities are going to be and whether as the organization wise are you ready for that experience and sometimes you might not be just because you know uh, you as the organization there might be a lot of political struggle and because of that you might not have enough cloud in the organization to be able to use the best of breed experience so if all of your systems and the architecture is not going to be aligned you are probably not going to get the benefit so again think through your options in terms of what you are looking for if you're looking for that best of breed cutting edge experience that is going to have the real financial value and businesses are going to see that you know once they hang in there if they do things in the right way if they are going to be utilizing the right consulting firms who really have depth in the enterprise architecture they will be able to provide you the experience that you are looking for and then you are going to see the real financial roi but that requires a ton of patience okay that most businesses don't have that on that note that's it for today if you joined for the first time this was part of our e-commerce series for which we meet every wednesday at 5:30 pm eastern uh, and we review one vendor or the solution from the e-commerce community so make sure you guys are going to be here next week we are going to come back with another solution or the vendor on that note thanks everyone for tuning in tonight thank you so much for listening into today's episode i always pick up learnings from our reviews and hopefully you picked up some learnings for yourself as well if anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business you might want to check other related episodes including the interview with Kirk Thompson from Chief Outsiders who discusses how team alignment may be necessary to align with your customer experience strategy also the interview with Jacqueline Lawfer who shares her insights into the Shopify pause and the challenges associated with international payments also don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds If you have any questions or comments about the show please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help thank you and I hope to get you on the next episode of the WBS podcast thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS podcast be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.